Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, somebody. Welcome to those of you who are tuning in online. Welcome to those who are at our headquarters in Midrand who are fellowshipping live in the live service. As you are coming in and you are tuning in online, I want to ask you to please write in the comment section which country you are tuning in from. Uh, where are you watching us from? As uh, Put your name and send him there. I want to give you a special shout out. I want to send out a special blessing and pray for you as well. Thank you so much. I want to encourage everybody to share this live broadcast. Share it on your friends' timelines. Um, share it on your own timeline. Share it on to your WhatsApp groups and all the groups that you belong to on Facebook. Let's make sure that we are populating heaven and we are depopulating hell and making sure that we are spreading the gospel. Amen, somebody. Today is Mother's Day. We are rejoicing voicing with the mothers in the house. Happy Mother's Day, wherever you are tuning in from, if your country is also celebrating Mother's Day. Amen. Today, the subject that I want to touch on very quickly is the God who sees, the God who sees. And I believe that this is a question a lot of mothers often ask themselves. Does anybody see me? Does anybody see my efforts? And today is not particularly an easy day for every single person because for some people, it is a painful Mother's Day because their mothers have passed on to glory, equally the same on my side. But there is something that tells me that if I hold on to the word of God, I know that God is looking after my mom who's now an angel up there and she's also looking down at me and being proud of me. Hallelujah. So I want to celebrate every single person who's a mother by female gender, by even male gender, uh, because I know that there are fathers who are there, their wives have passed on as well, but they are there holding the fort and they are also playing that nurturing and that mothering role. Amen. Two anchor scriptures that we are looking at today, you can read it at your own leisure and your time, but I'm going to paraphrase it as I go through the message today. Uh, Genesis chapter 16 verses 1 to 15, as well as Genesis chapter 21 verses 8 to 20. What difference does it make in your life to know that there is a God that is watching you and there is a God that sees you? As I said, I'm aware some, some way some people are still crying and I can see you, but I just want to say to you, hold on. This is the day that the Lord has made and God is going to give you encouragement. God is going to equip you to become the mother that you need to be as well so that you also live the legacy and the uh, for your lineage um, that they will be proud of. Amen. Somebody, we all just do the best that we can. Hallelujah. Um, and as I said, many of us are not mothers uh, because some are male by gender. Hallelujah. But we, are, we were all once children and we have gone through certain experiences that allow us to understand the role of a mother and the impact that a mother has in our life. Hallelujah. At some point or another, there has been a point where you have said, um, you know, you have called out to your mother. You wanted your mother to see something specific um, that um, you were doing and you wanted to show off. Maybe you were playing soccer. Maybe you were doing something. You were dancing or maybe you were singing or you were performing at school at a play and you wanted to your mother to see you. And everybody wants their mother to notice that they're doing something good or they've got a specific talent or gift that they are expressing. Amen. Somebody. And, you know, you know, often. And the children will say, mommy, 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 look at me, look at me, watch me. I know there's other children that are playing in the surroundings, but I want you to watch me, talk to me, somebody. And your mothers would always look at you because a mother, there's something about a mother that just says, stop, stop the bus. I want to see what my baby is doing. Hallelujah. Even though sometimes you may be doing the most goofiest thing or the most silliest thing or the most funniest thing, but mothers always have time. So we all know what that is like as a child of wanting to be seen by their mother. Hallelujah. And I believe there's people in our midst this morning that want God to see them because they know that not only is he our father, but he's your nature as well. Many of all of, of us have also seen um, um, or been a mom who wonders if God ever sees us because sometimes as mothers, we do so much and we also ask ourselves, does anybody see me? Because sometimes you don't get the appreciation or the thank yous that you want to get even from the people who are in your family, your loved ones, even your children. And sometimes, you know, they make so many demands and all these things. And you just wish somebody could just stop and say, I am grateful. Hallelujah. There's a beautiful article that I just quickly want to read for you. It's called I'm Invisible. Let me just read you this article just to put context to what we're talking about this morning. It says, it all began make, make, to make sense to me. The blank stares, the lack of response. 
the way one of the kids would walk into the room while I'm on the phone and ask to be taken to the store. And inside, I'm thinking, can't you see me? Can't you see that I'm on the phone? Obviously not. No one can see I am on the phone. Nobody can see that I'm cooking. Nobody can see that I'm sweeping the floor. Nobody can see that I'm standing on my head in the corner because no one can see me. I feel invisible. I'm doing so much for you guys and you don't see me. Can't you see me that I'm cooking and I'm tired? I'm coming back from work. Can you see me? Am I visible? Some days I'm only a pair of hands, nothing more. Some days I'm the kind of person that they approach and say, can you fix this? Can you tie this? Can you open this? Some days I'm not a pair of hands. I'm not even a human being. And that's how mummies feel, right? I'm a clock to ask, what time is it? What day is it? When are you doing this? When are you buying me this? I'm just a time clock. When they are demanding from me, when am I going to do this? What day am I going to do this? What time am I going to do this? How much money am I going to send? I was certain that these were the hands that once held books and the eyes that studied history, the mind that graduated. I went to school. I thought it would give me significance. I thought it would give me that renown, that, that, that recognition that I've achieved something. But there was a greater ministry. There was a greater role, that of being a mother, that nobody prepared me for, that nobody took me to school and gave me a certificate or graduated me for. I was a mother and I had to show up on every single role. I'm improvising, don't worry. But now they had all disappeared into the peanut butter, never sent, never to be seen again. And that's how mothers are. They disappear into the chores. They disappear into the different roles that they have to play. And all of a sudden you realize that one day she's gone. She's gone one day. She's gone the second day. She's gone the third day, never to be seen again. That's why we must value our mother's saints while they're still alive. It's a tragedy to see how many people have got time for friends. They've got time to gallivant and to be everywhere else except spending time with their mothers. They don't think their mothers are cool enough. They don't even want to take their friends or their associations to meet their mothers because they are ashamed. They're ashamed that they're not looking after their mothers. They're ashamed that they're not looking uh, after their parents, that they've not changed their lives of their parents, but yet they are portraying something different out there in the world. One day, they will be gone. One day, there won't be somebody to tie up your shoelaces. And at that time, you now ask, and, and, and a friend of mine this week was saying, when, when you leave the earth, what will be written in your obituary is that you left a husband or no husband. You left children. They don't write what you had. They don't write that you possess these cars or 15 cars or you possess mansions, but they write who you left behind. That becomes the significance of the obituary that we read about you. We can read about your degrees and your uh, and the books you wrote and, and, and the places you traveled and, and the organizations you started, but is that your legacy? So I don't know if you feel like that as a mom, but we're going to look at different Bible stories this morning. And when we are looking at these Bible stories, specifically the story of looking at a mother and a child to explore the truth that is relevant for all of us. This is a story in Genesis chapter 16, as I said to you, one of our anchor scriptures. The story in Genesis chapter 16 is a story about a mother and a child who both were misunderstood. Because sometimes we go through this journey and this life where we are not understood. A misunderstood mother, Genesis chapter 16, verses 1 to 15. In this story, we meet a mother, Hagar. She's an immigrant from Egypt and has no sense of belonging. She's running away from a household where her body has been used to produce an offspring for an infertile couple. So she's a surrogate. Like many daughters of Hagar, this Hagar is, mist is mistreated. She's trapped in a system where she feels as though she's invisible. 
She has no rights. She has no dignity. She has no freedom, no freedom of choice. But she has had enough. It is very hard to be a nobody with no name. Am I talking to somebody? She is referred to by Abram as Sarah and Sarah as the maid, the Egyptian maid. They don't even call her by name, but they just say she's the Egyptian maid. Sarah and Abraham did not really see Hagar as a person. She was there to serve a purpose. They probably didn't even notice that she actually ran away. It would seem to me that Hagar doesn't know what she wants. She knows what she doesn't want, though. And often at times we get to those positions where we might not necessarily tell you what exactly what we want, but we know what we don't want. We know that we don't want to be mistreated. She doesn't want to be treated as a non-person. She doesn't want to be treated as an invisible person. She doesn't realize what her greatest need is until she meets the God who meets the need that she actually has. And she names this need and this God. He says, you are El Roy. You are El Roy. Verse 13 says, I, you are the God who sees. So you are listening to the sound of my voice this morning. You are saying, I may not realize what my greatest need is until I meet the God that will meet that need. And that God is El Roy, the God who sees. And I am here to announce to somebody this morning that here this morning, you will meet the God who sees you, the God who sees. I wonder what name that you are looking for. I wonder what is that need and what God you are looking for this morning. What is that name you would give to a God who will meet your need per chance that you would meet him? Is it the God who loves? Is it the God who comforts? Is he the God who guides? Is he the God who forgives? Is he the God of a second chance? Who is this God that you need this morning? The God who sees that you need the love. The God who sees that you need that second and third and the fourth chance. The God who sees that you need his forgiveness. The God who will give you the guidance that you need. Talk to me, somebody. Amen, somebody. Make sure you are typing those amens if you're online. Hallelujah. So whatever you choose would actually say as much as about what you need. Whatever is your need, whatever you will choose to say will reveal the character of the God that you need because it is through our needs that we experience God in our deepest way. The God that you need at that particular time, that God will, will help you to experience your need and your need being met. Hagar, who might feel insignificant and misunderstood, is actually a very significant person. And I'm here to let you know and remind you that you are significant, mother. Hagar, the Egyptian maid, is the only person in the Bible who gives God a name. Up until this point, children of God, God was the one who was giving us his name. He was the one who was telling us that I am the I am that, that I am. God was the one up until this point who said, I am Elohim. I am the creator. He said, I am Yahweh. I am the covenant maker. He said, I'm El Shaddai. I'm the almighty. But Hagar and nobody stops and says, he is my El Roy. Before God announces it, he says, I will give you a name. You are the God who sees. You are the God who sees my suffering. You are the God who sees my ill treatment. You are the God who sees how I'm being mistreated. Hallelujah. There are vast, majestic names of God out there, but Hagar needs more than just a vast and a majestic God out there. All that Hagar needed was a God that sees. I speak to that mother that is listening to me this morning. You need a God that sees. You just want to see El Roy. She needs an intimate and a personal God. She needs a God that can meet her at the point of her need. Hallelujah. And she says, I have now seen the God who sees me. This is her declaration. I have now finally seen and met the God who sees me. I have thought a long while, saints, about why the statement is so important. Why would Hagar make such a declaration? Hallelujah. And let's look at the importance of the statement. What difference does it make? 
in your life, in my life, to know that there is a God who sees? What difference does that make as a mother, as a dad, as a man, as a woman, as a young person? Does it matter to you to know that there is a God that sees? I want to announce to you this morning that God sees you. God sees you, hallelujah. From the moment you start playing with thoughts of marriage, you uh, you want to be seen. I know that little girls, we normally play around and we want to be seen because you want to meet your Prince Charming. You describe him and all that and you do every single thing as you are growing up to be visible that somebody will notice you and tell you that you are beautiful. From the moment you go through that traumatic situation, you wonder if your pain is being seen. You are wondering if there's a God that sees your pain. No one wants to be lonely. You desperately want to know that somebody is there and that somebody is seeing you. From the moment I was raped personally as a child, when I was 13 years old, I wanted to know, God, are you there? Do you exist? Do you actually see me? Do you actually see my pain? Hallelujah. Some days I lived not knowing if there was a God. I did not see him. I did not perceive him. I did not sense him. The more my, 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 my Bible teachers kept on telling me that there's a God who understands your trauma, the God that will use your trauma to help others. I did not want to hear that. I just wanted to know personally and intimately and personally that there was a God that sees my trauma. Somebody's listening to me and you are crying because you are in an abusive relationship and you want to know, is there a God that sees me? Is there a God that sees me when these children don't even have a thank you for what am I doing for them? Is there a God that sees me? Talk to me somebody. I want to talk to somebody this morning who throughout their childhood or throughout their adulthood has been saying, I really just want to be seen. I want to know that somebody knows what I go through inside my closet. Somebody knows what I'm going through inside this private room that I'm in. I'm talking to that woman who didn't know or doesn't know that God exists, who doesn't know that God can see her. I'm talking to that man who doesn't know the God of this Bible, of this gospel that we preach about who doesn't know that there's a God that sees you even after you have closed that door and you have shut the door and you have shut yourself in in your prayer closet. There is a God that sees you. Hallelujah. I have realized some things that are true in the Bible. In the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7, the Bible says man looks at the outside appearance but God sees the heart. It is only God that can see the heart without a x-ray. It is only God that sees the heart before you go into the hospital, before they put you in a sauna machine. But there's a God that sees your heart inside of you that goes beyond the outside appearance. Talk to me. Hallelujah. I have realized that as a child, when people look at you, they often have misjudged you. Yes, I hear your cry right, right, this morning. Hallelujah. They have often uh, misunderstood even your motives for doing certain things. I know what it means to be misjudged or misunderstood, to be taught, thought of that you are bossy while you are just moving in your in, in in your lane and you are you are just a leader naturally and 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 you are just called to teach i know what it means when you're looking for a god that says god do you see me i know what it means to be hated because you are misunderstood and you are misjudged hallelujah i want to believe that there's somebody this morning who's saying, God, can you see what is inside of me? Can you see beyond the closed doors in my closet, in my prayer room? Man looks at the outside appearance, but God looks at the heart. And of course, it is only God that can actually see the heart of men. Many years later, I discovered that God sees my secret thoughts and God lives in my secret world. Many years later, I then began to understand that God knows me and God knows you. There's nobody that knows you like God. Many years later, I knew that God knows every single inch of my room. Hallelujah. If ever there was a truth about uh, a moment that was written in the Bible, in the book of Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, it says, when you pray, go into your room and close the door. There's a reason that scripture was written there, because sometimes in the crowd and in the noise of the outside world, you might miss the fact that there's a God that is looking at you. When you go into your room, shut the door, close the door, when you pray and you start to have an intimate relationship with God and when you start to talk to God and you understand 
that there is a God that sees you, that wants to answer you, that wants to block out all the noise and the other voices. When you go into that prayer room in your closet, you've gotten it. Finally, you understand. Hallelujah. So we all have a fundamental need to be seen. That's why we say and utter those words, watch me, mommy. Look at what I'm doing. Look at how many flips I can do. Look at how I performed at school. Look at how, how much progress I'm making. Watch me, daddy. Hallelujah. So you don't really understand human nature unless you know why. Even sometimes when children are playing, they keep on looking for their parents because they want their attention. So this morning, I just want to comfort somebody's heart and say there's a God that sees you. In the book of Psalm chapter 139 verse 16, the Bible says, Before I formed you, I saw you. My eyes saw your unformed body. Before I formed you. That means before conception, he sees you. Before conception, he sees what you will even look like before your body has been formed. So God sees what anyone else does not see before anybody else saw your form. Before the sauna showed us whether you're going to be a girl or a boy, before you were shaped in your mother's womb, he sees you. Hallelujah. He envisages us into being. And once he envisages us to being and he creates us to be that thing that he formulated in his mind before conception, before your parents even got together. And he says he watches over us because he watches over his creation to make sure that the creation will operate the way he intended it to be. That you will become the person that he wanted you to be. Tell your neighbor, God sees you. God sees you. I don't know what these words mean for you this morning. I don't know what you are thinking. I don't know what goes through your mind when you are conceptualizing the idea that there's a God that watches over his creation, that watches over you and me. I don't know what you're thinking, but I want you to know that there are the eyes of God that are loving. I want you to know that you can relax in the presence of God because God is watching. When they, when, when, when they persecute you, God is watching. To be seen, child of God, is to mean something like you are significant. And everybody wants that validation that they are significant. And to be seen means that if somebody is watching over me, that means I am protected, that there is a hedge around me, that I am safe. Talk to me, somebody. Jeremiah 24, 6 says, my eyes will watch over them for their good. That's talking about the children of Israel. He says, my eyes will watch over them for they are good. I'm watching watching over you for they are good. That's talking about me and you. When they were in exile, they were miles away from home thinking, maybe God doesn't know us anymore. Maybe God has forgotten us. Maybe God has not, is not remembering what we are going through. They had hung up their harps. They didn't want to praise him. They don't want to worship him. And they were weeping. But God sends a word through the prophet. He says, my eyes see them. I will watch over them in the wilderness, in exile. My eyes see you when you are going through that moment and you are lacking and you are wondering, do I even have something to eat today? My eyes are watching over you. My eyes are watching over that mother who doesn't know what they will feed their child today. My eyes are watching over you, daddy. My eyes are watching over you. You are going to make it the God who sees. What does it mean to be seen, Pastor Fortune? It means you are living under a, 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 an, an eye that is gazing from a loving heavenly father. There's a beautiful verse in the book of Zephaniah chapter 3 verse 17, which he says, he will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. The noise, the anxiety must be quieted with the love of God because he is taking de great delight in you. He wants to see you at peace. He wants to see you prosper. He's the one that is going to open up the window. You will not lack anymore. Hang on to him. God will send you the destiny helper who will make sure that you are able to do 
what you need to do for your children. Talk to me, somebody. Hallelujah. Are we tracking together? Hallelujah. Do you know that feeling, child of God, of being quieted by the love of God? where you just quieted by the love of God, where you just have peace that surpasses all understanding, where, where, where you just dare to sit and be loved and be seen. When you are loved, you are seen. Somebody shared a story with me this morning before they went to church and, and, and they said, there was a couple and, and, and this man sacrificed so much for this young girl where they met when they were still young and he paid for her school fees and this child went through and graduated and the first thing that this girl did when they got married was to buy this man a, a, a Dodge Caliber or something like that, a beautiful car. And to this day, this man cannot stop singing the praises of his wife because he says the way this woman loved me, he did not, she did not, she did not forget the love I poured on her. Some of you, it will not be financially that you are pouring into somebody, but your emotional presence, your emotional connection will be the one that actually unlocks that peace of mind, that love. Some of you need to be there for your children. Some of you need to be there just to physically show up. Even if you cannot financially maintain I want to urge those of you who are men and listening to the, this message that please go and be supportive to your children. Be a present father. Don't be an absent father. Don't fight your baby mamas. Be there. Be present. Those of you who have wives and, 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 and you have mothers that you have not looked after, look after them. There's many ways you can express yourself, even in the season when you don't have the money. And when you have the money, you pour out the money. It's okay. Seasons are different. There's a love that quietens things. There's a love that makes you feel at peace. Psalm 33 verses 13 to 15 says, The Lord looks down from heaven. He's looking. He's, he's got his, I don't know what they call it, those binoculars. He's looking. He's looking down from heaven. He sees all the sons of men from his dwelling place. He looks out on the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all. He who understands all their works. He understands. He understands as he looks. To be seen. To be understood. To be encouraged by God. It is because there is a God who sees. So that verse from Matthew chapter 6 verse 6. Talks about all this. That you are seen and by a God that understands what you're going through. He understands your works. He understands everything you are going through. He's looking at you. He's protecting you. Your father who sees what you do in secret, he says, I will reward you. He will reward you publicly for the things you do in secret. God sees you. Somebody type it in the comment section. God is seeing you. What will he reward you with? He will reward you with his presence. He will reward you with his pleasure. He will reward you with his peace. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, somebody. The God who sees. Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, that you're a God that sees. I thank you for encouraging that woman, that man that is listening to this message this morning. Thank you, Lord, that you're a God who sees. In the second book of Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 6, hallelujah, King David was bringing the ark back to Jerusalem. David, the king who had many, had, had, uh, many people who looked to him, they looked up to him, but he looked up to one person. He looked up to God. I know what it means to have people, mouths that you need to feed, people who are depending on you, people who are depending on you to bail out your siblings, to take your siblings to school, your mother who was hoping that by now you would have uh, landed a job, that you would be supporting them. They are looking up to you. And the only avenue you have is to look up to God, is to look up to God. Amen, somebody. We look up to God. So David was a man who was looking up to God. He looked to God and he lived his life before an audience of one person. And that is the only person that you need to look up to. He brought the ark back to Jerusalem because he knew how much it would thrill God, how much it would please God. And he danced for joy. 
This was a man who had no limitations, no inhibitions. He, he, nothing was inhibiting him. He just danced for the Lord. We read in the verse uh, 16 of 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 16, he says, As the ark of the Lord was entering the city of David, Michal, daughter of Saul, watched from a window. And when she saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, she despised him in her heart. Verse 20 says, When David returned home to bless his household, Michal, daughter of Saul, came out to meet him and said, How the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants, as any vulgar fellow would. David said to Michal, It was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's, uh, the, the Lord's people of Israel. Hallelujah. I will celebrate before the Lord. I will become even more undignified than this and I will be humiliated in my own eyes but by this, these, these slaves girls that you spoke of I will be held in honor when God knows you are doing something for him he will reward you in public and he will hold you up in honor it doesn't matter who is ridiculing you it doesn't matter who is looking down on you hallelujah this is an amazing passage because David doesn't mind what the crowds think. People, I don't care what the people think. As long as I'm looking to my audience of one person and I'm pleasing this one person because I know that when he looks down at me, he protects me. When he looks at me, his heart is moved and touched by my infirmity and he moves to do something about it. His hedge of protection is active around me. He's sending his angels to do something about whatever it is that I'm going through. He's going to make sure he's the God that sees. Hallelujah. He doesn't mind what his wife thinks. He doesn't mind whoever else is saying. He doesn't mind what the slave girls were saying. So I'm asking you this morning, are you free before the Lord to do whatever it is that the Lord would have you to do? I wonder if you've ever gotten over yourself that you can just experience God and his beauty and his wonders and just the, the, the intimacy and, 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 and just to experience his personality and to just let yourself go and knowing that you're resting in the hands of your Abba Father. Hallelujah. What about to the point of being able to step into things, not caring about what other people are thinking, knowing that it is before the Lord. Hallelujah. The Lord is seeing you. The Lord sees you bringing the ark back. The Lord is celebrating. The eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth. Why? Why? His eyes are moving to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. If your heart is completely belonging to God, his eyes are going to and fro looking for whom he will protect, looking for whom he will usher and shower his love to. I don't know if the thought of God seeing you makes you feel scared or makes you feel comfortable or safe. For Hagar, it gave her courage. So I want to say to somebody this morning that the God who sees, the God who saw Hagar, may he give you encouragement and may he give you the comfort that you are believing him for. She did go back to live in the home of Abraham and Sarah, but she went back empowered. She went back with courage. Receive the courage from God. A child that was misunderstood Hagar's son grew up and it became unbearable again. So she left again. Uh, when you turn to Genesis chapter 21, you see how Hagar being met by God again, running away. She's running away because the son is misunderstood and God opens her eyes to see something she didn't realize was there. And that's exactly how God normally operates. Genesis chapter 21 verse 8 to 20. I don't know if you with your children have gotten to the end of your resources. And you feel like all resources have run out and you can't do it anymore. You can't be the mom to the child that you thought you could be. You can't provide for your children anymore. If that is the situation, you are exactly where Hagar was. Hallelujah. The Bible says that the son grew up in the desert because Hagar had discovered the source of life in the desert. God gave Hagar the courage and she discovered what it was to be strongly supported by God, even in the desert when no one else knows. And no one else cares. No one else sees. No one else can help. But God sees. In the point where you are chucked out of your own home, of your own mansion, of your own 
whatever possessions you might be having and you find yourself in the streets, you find yourself living in a back room, in a one-roomed house with all your children, there is a God that sees. When all your friends have abandoned you and nobody supports you, nobody gives you even money to go to work or to go to that interview, but there's a God that sees. So this morning, I hope you have met a God who sees. When you come to him and you look back at your life and you look, look back at the journey that you have traveled and you can pinpoint the times when you realized that God was watching over you because I, I strongly believe that as you look back on your life, you will see that there was a God that sees, that we worship a God that sees. You might say, how come, Pastor Fortune, if they are seen by the God who sees, he doesn't do anything? Well, he does. I want to tell you that he definitely does something about it. We are the body of Christ. When God sees our pain, he looks for somebody to work through to make sure that he sees us and he brings us the help. That is why when we pray prayers of destiny help us, we know that God works through another human being to bring us the help that we need. Isaiah 44 verse 17 to 18 says, the idols do not see you. Their eyes are plastered over so they cannot see. Hallelujah. There are people who are worshipping gods who don't see them. They are worshipping idols. They are sacrificing their lives on altars of idols that they cannot see. And those idols cannot see. But God, who might be invisible to you, is actually a God that sees. And this is what Hagar discovered when she fled into the desert. He dis she discovered that there's a God that sees me. He knows my name. The Lord knows your name. The God, see God sees you. Failing is a part of life, yes. You will fail and you will fall, but you will get up. We fall and we get up. God can't stop everything that hurts us at any particular time. We have to go through that pain through, so that we go through life's experiences and be empowered and move on to the next level. But we have to choose our own dependence on God so that we graduate out of that classroom, so that we come out of that valley season, so that our dry bones can live again. The sooner you get dependent on God and you say, God, you are the God who sees me. Elroy, come to my rescue. Step outside of your situation. Step into what God has for you. God has the best for you. Hide yourself in God. Hide yourself in God. Then that thing that was meant to hurt you, it will just be bumping just like, it will just come and bounce out or bounce back or bounce away from you. Because that thing will not have the ability to hurt you because you know that your heart is protected by God. Am I communicating to somebody? And it might look like God is not preventing certain things from happening right now. He's just waiting for you to be fully dependent on him. The God who sees me, answer me this morning. The God who sees me, answer me this morning. Thank you, Holy Spirit. When you go through the Bible and you look at the book of Job and you see what Job went through. Job lost all his children. He lost all his possessions. He lost everything. But the end of it all, Job said, my eyes and ears have, my eyes have seen you. My ears have heard of you. But now my eyes have seen you. So Job says, I have heard of you. I've heard of your works, but my eyes have seen you. Because the pain he actually saw, he knew that God was seeing. Don't let your pain stop you from seeing what God did for Adam and Mary. Don't let, don't let the pain stop you from delivering the Messiah as Mary did. What did God do for Adam in the Garden of Eden? What did God do for Noah? What did God do for David? Don't let the pain stop you. Do not let the pain stop you. Father, the God who sees. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are the God that sees. We thank you, Holy Spirit, that as we charge out to even celebrate this day, oh God, that this woman or the man that is hearing the sound of my voice today, dear God, 
Let them experience you, Elroy. Let them experience the God who sees. Let them experience the God whose eyes go to and fro, who is looking after us in Jesus' mighty name. Let them look back and see the imprint, everything that you have done for them in Jesus' mighty name. Holy Spirit, we thank you. We glorify your holy name. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Amen and amen. I trust that this message has been an encouragement to somebody who cannot help themselves and realizes that they need the help of God. And just like Hagar, you look back and you will see that God is a God that has been watching over you. Amen. Fix your eyes on Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Don't be wondering about... Don't be like the world who is looking around for other solutions. Look unto God and he will make sure that he orchestrates people who will come. He will make sure that he draws your destiny helpers towards you in Jesus' mighty name. So God is going to send help at the time of need in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you so much, those of you who have been tuning in on YouTube and on Facebook. And those of you who will listen or re uh, the, to the replay of this message, please leave a comment. Um, follow us on all social media channels. I'm Fortunate Online, also on Instagram. Make sure you are dropping a comment. Inbox me. Let me know whether the messages that you are finding on this channel are empowering you and you are growing spiritually in Jesus' name. Thank you for those who are choosing to partner with me. The details for the PayPals is also, I think, scrolling down there at the bottom. But you can also use the YouTube feature to do to send your thank yous and your appreciation. God bless you and goodbye. Thank you.